I make a, just a point by what Ricky suggested, if you could carry that also to the government, that an SRA project must mandatorily include social infrastructure and open space as per the planning norms. I mean, I, I think that's extremely exactly. important. Exactly. We are interested Definitely. in education, in health, yeah. and recreation. Very true. Yeah. In, Thank you. in Dharavi, we've gone beyond no, I'm that. talking about the SRA pro policy and the projects. Thank you. I have a couple of more questions. Um, one is about density, uh, densification. Um, to me, urbanity is all about density, um, but some people aren't comfortable with density, and, and I'm wondering what is the perspective uh, of government, of uh, the, the advocates, uh, the NGOs, on this question of densification? Others? Well, I think uh, the, point has, the point has already been made yeah. uh, by Mr. Shirish Patel. He pointed out that Dharavi already has one of the highest density and that the rehabilitation, if it is going to have a cross-subsidizing mechanism, is going to add to the density. And that's the issue that he has already made. Well, what we are trying to do since the discussion is more on Dharavi is that the free sale component is likely to be more of commercial in nature so that apart from the families of which are going to be rehabilitated there. I think there is some confusion about the figures you mentioned. You, you said, okay, I mentioned 70,000 with 236 families. hectares. No, we are talking of 144 hectares at the moment in Dharavi. We are not, okay. that is the total circumference of 236. But uh, we are talking of 144 hectares. So if we go, we feel that we will go in for commercial or uh, office space so that at least the density would fall sharply after office hours. It happens, for example, in south, in this part of the city, that where we are all assembled today, that the density is very high during the day because it's a hub of commercial and office activity, but at night or in the evening, it tends to fall dramatically. Thank you. Tony, I see you there with the microphone. Please. Please stand and tell us who you are. Tell us. Is this working? Ah, yeah. it is. Tony Travers from the LSE. Picking up Enrique Penalosa's question about whether or not London in its evolution offers any implications for this discussion. And I think there's no question that London in the 1830s, 40s, 50s was very heavily, very densely populated at levels not dissimilar to those revealed uh, for Mumbai today, infrastructure thinned that out. The building of railways took people way out from the centre. Railways that today we see as an opportunity to redensify cities helped take people away. But in the context of the debate about social housing, there's no question that uh, social housing was built to replace slums. It provided subsidised low rents. However, the long-term implication of it has been, in the London case, it doesn't have to be this everywhere, that that housing never had sufficient money to maintain it to appropriate standards. And in many ways, it traps the poor in poor housing even to today. <coughs> and so it became reinforcing of poverty, did not allow people to move on because it subsidized them, in effect, to remain poor. That is something that definitely needs to be tackled by, I think, all politicians in all cities, even today. So, Tony, you raise a point that is very much consistent with the American experience, and it raises the question that I think we're learning a lot from here, and, and are we saying that poor people in concentrated communities are incapable of, of creating community that is uh, both uh, productive and uh, beneficial to the broader society and to themselves. I think what I was only saying is there is a risk of utopian housing solutions in early days in an attempt to sweep away slums that then create large concentrations of poor people which simply works against their likely capacity to develop their own lives. And we now tend to think of cities as working better 
where people of different income levels, as far as possible, live in broadly mixed areas. And I think that that is the lesson of some of, certainly Britain's, social housing worst experiments. Right. It's very helpful. So we're going to have to wrap up. I want to uh, thank this amazing panel of speakers today. Please join me in thanking them.